famed English playwright Edward Bulwer Lytton once said, the pen is mightier than the sword. Wise words indeed, that we now all recognize as being representative of the vast power that the written word can command, particularly when it is sandwiched inside of a cover, bound and distributed on mass in book form. So potentially powerful is a book, in fact, that over the years, many of them have found themselves banned the world over. And today, we should be having a look at five of them so that we can learn all about exactly what it is a book has to be, say and represent in order to find itself on the wrong side of the senses. So let's jump in. Our first band book comes from the pen of one George Orwell, Animal Farm. He penned it in 1945, and it tells a seemingly simple tale of farm animals rebelling against their human farmer to establish a society of their own. Hidden in the subtext, however, is a much deeper and more meaningful message, as Animal Farm is really a potent critique of totalitarianism in general and Stalinism in particular. You see, Orwell, the democratic socialist himself, was disillusioned by the Soviet Union's betrayal of revolutionary ideals, which he witnessed firsthand during the Spanish Civil War and heard even more about as further stories of the horrors of Stalinism began to trickle their way back to Blighty. An animal farm was his way of trying to do something about it. Animal Farm received immediate critical acclaim and became an immediate classic of English literature. So much so, in fact, that we're willing to bet that many of you watching this had to study it at school. I absolutely did. And at this point of the video, we'd normally, hopefully, do some clever lead into the meat of the chapter, which in this case would probably be encouraging you to have a guess at which countries banned Animal Farm. But in this instance, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It was the communist ones. In the Soviet Union, it was outright banned the moment its implications and narrative became known. The Soviet government under Stalin and his successors maintained strict control over literary publications and deemed Animal Farm as dangerously counter-revolutionary, which in non-gobbledygook meant its portrayal of the revolution's betrayal by its leaders hit a bit too close to the mark, making its ban a bit of a no-brainer for them. This ban also extended to the Eastern European countries then under Soviet influence such as East Germany, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. In modern post-Soviet Russia, this book is no longer banned, but interestingly, this happened before the Union even collapsed thanks to Gorbachev glasnost reforms. China, with its similar ideological stance, also banned Animal Farm. The Chinese Communist Party, keen on preserving its narrative and control, saw Orwell's work as a threat to its legitimacy and authority. Although today it is now available in a heavily edited form. Similarly, North Korea has also supposedly banned Animal Farm, and we say supposedly because accurate information about North Korea is so hard to come by, and so we don't want to commit to anything regarding that country unless we see it with our own eyes. But communist countries aren't the only ones to have banned Animal Farm, as it was also banned in the United Arab Emirates in 2002, not for its political commentary, but because it contained talking pigs, which the country's government claimed conflicted with Islamic values regarding the portrayal of animals in literature. Then there is the US, where Animal Farm has never been outright banned at a national level, but has a peculiar relationship with the powers that be. Unlike the clear-cut cases of censorship in the previous instances, challenges to the book in the US have often arisen from a complex interplay of political ideology, educational policy, and community standards. During the Cold War era, for example, which was marked by a heightened fear of communism and a strong push for American patriotism, Animal Farm found itself both lauded and scrutinized at the same time. On one hand, Animal Farm was promoted by the CIA, which even funded the 1954 animated film adaptation of the book as part of its cultural offensive against the Soviet Union. But on the other hand, Animal Farm has also been removed from school curriculums and libraries in various parts of the United States, with an example coming from Florida in 1987 when it was pulled from shelves by the Bay County School Board. Local level bans such as these were typically motivated by a profound misunderstanding of its message, with those that pulled the plug usually being under the impression that the the book was actually promoting Soviet communism somehow. All right, let's stick with Orwell again in this chapter, as Animal Farm was far from the only work of his to be banned, and we'll have a look at 1984, a dystopian novel that he first published in 1949. The book itself is a critique of authoritarianism, and is set in a fictional future world where society is tyrannized by the party, led by the enigmatic Big Brother. 
It narrates the story of Winston Smith, a low-ranking party member in the nation of Oceania who secretly despises the regime that he lives under. Through Winston, the party is shown to have near omnipotent control over its citizens, employing advanced surveillance techniques and manipulating truth and history to maintain its power and control. Though, through the arc of Winston's rebellion against the system and its tragic consequences, Orwell explores themes of truth, individuality, and the corrupting nature of absolute power. Orwell, disheartened by the totalitarian regimes of both Nazi Germany and the Stalinist Soviet Union, wanted 1984 to act as a warning against the dangers of authoritarianism. By intentionally hyperbolizing it to the nth degree, Orwell hoped that his readers would appreciate the liberties they already had and fight to not just preserve them, but to expand them. And if nothing else, 1984 certainly got people thinking about authoritarianism, as many of the terms he coined in the book have now entered the common lexicon with Big Brother, Doublethink, Thought Crime, and Newspeak all being examples of such terms. From that brief literary review, then, you could probably guess some of the countries that 1984 was banned in. That's right, it was the communists once again. Specifically, the Soviet Union, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Albania, Yugoslavia, Hungary, North Korea, and China, just to name a few. Generally speaking, 1984 became available in those countries if and when its communist regime collapsed. Although, in the case of the Soviet Union, 1984, just like Animal Farm before it, was actually unbanned before the Union collapsed, thanks to Gorbachev's reforms. As for China, the book was soft unbanned in the 1990s when a heavily edited version, reworked as an exclusive commentary on fascism, was released. And as for its current status in North Korea, again, we've got no idea, though we know where we would put in our money if we were betting types. No further than 1984 has also been banned in the free and democratic West from time to time, although notably these bans tended to be much smaller scale and shorter lived than the blanket no that were slapped on it in the communist countries. For instance, the novel faced challenges in the US, where it was removed from the reading lists and libraries in some schools and communities. One notable example occurred in Jackson County, Florida in 1981, where it was pulled from shelves for being pro-communist and containing explicit sexual matter, and in 1977 at a school in Hawk Point, Missouri, where it was deemed objectionable by her parents. Once again, quite how someone managed to read the work and come away thinking it had a pro-communist message, we have absolutely no idea. In more recent years, 1984, the novel that oh so many have sought to see expunged from the pages of history, has experienced a resurgence in popularity and relevance, and now is often cited in discussions on privacy, surveillance, and government control in the digital age. Is it more relevant than ever, or is it just a damn well-written book? Well, that's for you to decide. All right, so now we've looked at two of Orwell's books that were banned for their various warnings of government outreach. Let's have a look at a book that was banned for something very different, specifically nonsery. Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. First published in 1955, Lolita is told through the perspective of its narrator, Humbert Humbert, an outwardly cultured and intelligent man who also happens to have a disturbing obsession for prepubescent girls, or as he calls them, nymphettes. The story unfolds with Humbert's fixation on a 12-year-old girl named Dolores Hayes, whom he nicknamed Lolita, and that's where we're going to start with the literary review portion of this chapter because, well, you can guess where it goes from there. The controversy surrounding Lolita, quite unsurprisingly, stems from its subject matter, with the main issue being the fact that the story, as we just said, is told through Humbert's perspective, which means that the reader experiences Humbert trying to justify his exploitation and abuse of Dolores, which many critics say glorifies or normalizes child sexual abuse. Further to this fact is that Humbert's wider lifestyle, i.e. when he's not noncing, is presented in a glamorous manner, which critics argue serves only to further glamorize his noncery. As for where Lolita was actually banned, France, where the novel was first published, imposed a ban from 1956 to 1959, a reaction to both the public and critical uproar over its contentious themes. The UK also prohibited its sale during the same period for similar reasons. Then, in 1959, it was banned in Argentina, Australia, and New Zealand, with it later being unbanned in Australia in 1965 and New Zealand in 1964. Seemingly, it's still banned in Argentina to this day, but don't quote us on that because clarification on the matter was hard to come by. Despite the controversy, Lolita has a its fair share of celebrants, who laud the book for Nabokov's masterful use of language, intricate wordplay, and deep psychological insight. The novel is also hailed for its narrative complexity, rich character development, and its ability to provoke intense emotional and intellectual responses. Nabokov's stylistic brilliance and the novel's exploration of themes such as obsession, madness, and the elusive nature of love have earned it a place as a classic in world literature. 
some people say that anyway. Nabokov himself maintained that Lolita was an exploration of tyranny over the mind of another and the brutality of misplaced or obsessive love rather than an endorsement of Humbert's actions. Stating further that this novel, through its controversial subject matter and complex narrative structure, challenges readers to reflect on the nature of evil, the manipulation of reality through art, and the ethical implications of empathizing with morally reprehensible characters. All right, let's take a look at The Anarchist's Cookbook, written by William Powell in 1971 as a form of protest against the Vietnam War and the US government. The book contains instructions on creating explosives, drugs, and engaging in guerrilla warfare, all with the aim of empowering individuals against what Powell perceived as oppressive governmental forces. Powell himself later disavowed the book and its intentions, but that hasn't stopped it from being wildly successful, with the book having sold over two million copies in the territories where it wasn't banned. Strictly speaking, The Anarchist Cookbook is banned in only one territory, Australia, where it was refused classification upon release by the Office of Film and Literature Classification, thus making it effectively banned without having to use the word, as such a judgment legally prohibits its sale in the country. Note also that it was banned in Canada up until 2002, when the Customs and Revenue Agency ruled that it didn't violate hate or obscenity laws and cleared it for import, thus giving it a legal route into the country, despite the actual ban still being in effect. Elsewhere, it is isn't exactly banned per se, but it straddles the line. In the UK, for example, while the book isn't outright banned, having it found on your possession while you either commit or conspire to commit other crimes, violent or not, is a great way to convince the judge to throw the book at you. In 2021, for example, a 23-year-old Cambridge graduate was convicted of collecting information useful to a person committing or preparing an act of terrorism based on his possessing the book and was sent to the NIC for three years as a result, despite submitting evidence that showed he possessed the book for academic research purposes. Similarly, in 2007, a 17-year-old boy was arrested under anti-terror laws for possession of the book, as was a 27-year-old man in 2017, although both of them were later acquitted. A similar state of affairs exists in the US, where again, the anarchist cookbook isn't banned per se, but lots of people and groups really want it to be. A leading example is the FBI, who are on record describing it as one of the crudest, lowbrow, paranoiac writing efforts ever attempted. So worked was the FBI by its publication that they launched an investigation into Powell in which they put him under intense surveillance and attempted to find legal grounds to ban the book's sale. Ultimately, however, they dropped their crusade against the book when a senior staffer ruled that the book was already so heavily proliferated it was pointless to try and ban it. After that, others picked up the mantle of having the anarchist cookbook banned in the US, with Senator Dianne Feinstein calling for it to be banned as recently as 2015, with her saying that it should be, quote, removed from the internet. The most surprising American of all calling for its ban, however, would be Powell himself. We've already said that he disavowed the book and its aims, but in reality, his disdain for his own creation went much further than that. As he grew older and driven by a sense of deep shame over what he had created, he became something of a self-imposed hermit, eventually emigrating rural France to escape the constant harassment that he was receiving from the media and public alike. This isolation did little to quell his self-disgust, however, and by 2013, he was outright calling for the book to be removed from print and banned. And to finish us off today, let's take a look at a really controversial book, The Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie, the work that intertwines magical realism with historical events to explore the complexities of faith, identity, and cultural conflict. Published in 1988, Rushdie's novel draws its title from a debunked, falsified, and highly misrepresented set of Quranic verses dubbed the Satanic Verses, within which the Prophet Muhammad supposedly acknowledged a group of three pagan Meccan goddesses, specifically Alat, Aluza, and Minat. The novel itself weaves together the lives of two Indian expatriates, Gibriel Farishta and Saladin Chamcha, who miraculously survive a plane bombing and undergo transformative experiences that explore the themes of divine intervention and personal personal crisis. To summarize, Farishta experiences visions that lead him to assume the identity of the archangel Gabriel, while Chamcha undergoes a humiliating transformation that tests his sense of belonging and identity. The narrative delves deep into themes of migration, cultural dislocation, and the struggle between faith and doubt, using a blend of humor, tragedy, and satire. Through its complex characters and intertwined stories, Rushdie examines the nature of religious faith, the conflict between traditional beliefs and modernity, and the personal quests for meaning and identity in a rapidly changing world. 
The Satanic Verses received widespread critical acclaim upon its publication, but also ignited immediate controversy. Its portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad, referred to in the book under the thinly veiled guise of Mahound, and the inclusion of the controversial Satanic Verses narrative, were perceived by many in the Muslim world as blasphemous and deeply offensive, and many outside the Islamic faith could sympathize, as it was rather bluntly done, to say the least. As a result of this, the book was banned in numerous countries with significant Muslim populations, as well as countries that frankly just found the whole thing rather tasteless, including India, Bangladesh, Sudan, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Thailand, Tanzania, Indonesia, Singapore, Venezuela, and Pakistan, among others. For Rushdie, however, his book being banned so widely was the least of his concerns, as Ayatollah Rahala Khomeini, the then leader of Iran, not only banned it, but also put a $3 million bounty on his head, announcing it with the following judgment on Iranian radio quoting, We are from Allah, and to Allah we shall return. I am informing all brave Muslims of the world that the author of the Satanic Verses, a text written, edited, and published against Islam, the Prophet of Islam, and the Quran, along with all the editors and publishers aware of its contents, are condemned to death. I call on all valiant Muslims, wherever they may be in the world, to kill them without delay, so that no one will dare insult the sacred beliefs of Muslims henceforth. And whoever is killed in this cause will be a martyr, Allah willing. Meanwhile, if someone has access to the author of the book but is incapable of carrying out the execution, he should inform the people so that Rushdie is punished for his actions. As a result of this, Rushdie immediately went into hiding, where he remains to this day, still being a near total shut in who never leaves his home without significant security. This may sound extreme, maybe even paranoid, but history has proven it a prudent approach, as on the 12th of August 2022, 36 years after the Satanic Verses was published, he was attacked during a rare public appearance in New York and stabbed in the neck, eye, stomach, thigh, and chest. He survived this, but after six long weeks in the hospital, he was left blinded in one eye and lost the use of one of his hands. Further to this, his publishers, translators, and booksellers associated with the Satanic Verses have also been targeted over the years, resulting in several violent attacks, the worst of which targeted on one Hitoshi Iragashi, the Japanese translator, left him dead in 1991. Ultimately, the Satanic Verses remains highly controversial to this day, with some Muslims and those sympathetic to the dignity of their faith maintaining that the text was right to be banned for its coarse vandalism of the sacred while others defend Rushdie's right to publish the text vehemently.